Welcome back to the channel, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Dr. Nav. The majority of you guys know that I'm a fellow at UCLA, and as a part of my fellowship, one of the things that we have to do is a quality improvement project. The specific project that I chose to do was on atypical presentations of older adults to the emergency department. I wanted to throw this on YouTube just in case somebody might be looking for it, whether it's because you love your grandparents or your great grandparents, or if you're a med student, or if you're a resident, or if you're a fellow, or if you're an attending. This video is made for attendings in the emergency department. So anybody who's interested in learning more about atypical presentations will likely find this useful. Please give it a huge thumbs up and share with somebody. Hi everyone, my name is Nav Badesha and I am a Geriatric Medicine Fellow with the UCLA VA program. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today on atypical presentations of disease in the older adult. It's estimated that around 12 to 43 percent of patients that present to the ER are above the age of 65 and more than half of these patients may present with a disease state that may be missing some of the traditional core features of illness usually seen in younger patients. But I do have some good news. About 99% of these atypical presentations had some component of a geriatric syndrome. And if you don't know exactly what that is, after today's conversation, I can guarantee you'll feel just a little bit more confident when an elderly patient walks into the emergency room. Patients with an atypical presentation have worse clinical outcomes so the ER staff's ability to recognize these groups of patients can lead to better outcomes, ensure proper clinical monitoring, and lead to more timely treatment. After today, you should have an understanding of typical and atypical presentations, why they're more common in the older adult, identify geriatric syndromes and use them to spot atypical presentations, learn how comorbidities influence atypical presentations, and how comprehensive geriatric assessments develop a coordinated plan to maximize overall health with aging. Let's start with the concept of homeostenosis. We all have some form of physiologic reserve, as you can see here, but when we're younger, our physiologic reserve is this big and this large. And as we get older, the physiologic reserve actually becomes narrow, which basically means that if you had an illness here, you have all this reserve to be able to fight it. But when you're older, and if you have an illness here, you only have this much. And therefore older people present very differently compared to younger people. As we age, we have poor tolerance and poor response to fluctuations in blood volume. So if the volume changes occur rapidly, it's very hard for an older person's body to compensate and to respond quickly to it. That's because the physiologic reserve is smaller. There's also increased circulating catecholamines with blunted receptor response, which basically means that an older person is like a younger person on a beta blocker. An example of this can be when a patient is not having tachycardia, even though they've lost blood. You can see things like decreased pain and temperature perception, decreased humoral and cell-mediated immunity, and decreased response to pyrogens which can all contribute to an atypical presentation, such as a pneumonia without a fever and without a white count. As we get older, the blood flow to the kidneys goes down, and this does affect how medications work. And interestingly, the ability to perceive thirst decreases as well, making them more prone to dehydration. In summary, a decreased physiologic reserve means every organ system is a little bit slower and a little bit less resilient. Now, with this understanding of aging, let's go ahead and get into a case presentation of a typical presentation. If a 67-year-old who presents to the ER with chest pain, his main complaint is that he has an eight out of 10 crushing chest pain that radiates down his left arm that lasted about one hour. He's noticed a similar chest pain that worsens on exertion, but today 
he mentions it's also occurring at rest. He does mention he has significant shortness of breath, has a chronic cough with productive sputum. What are the main differential diagnoses? His troponins come back elevated. EKG shows an acute anterior MI. The diagnosis is easy. The patient receives immediate intervention with cardiac catheterization. Although the patient has a complex medical history that could bring you to a number of different differentials, this was a classic presentation and overall easy to catch. Let's compare this to an 87-year-old male with a history of COPD, diverticulitis, type 2 diabetes, mild cognitive impairment, frailty, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and irritable bowel syndrome. His neighbor brings him into the emergency department, says he just doesn't look right and didn't seem like himself. The patient does say he feels unwell. He does report an epigastric pain and nausea without vomiting, and he does appear a little bit more confused than usual. He's triaged by the nursing staff, and they go through a symptoms list. He doesn't sound very emergent and is assigned as semi-urgent priority. What are your differential diagnoses? His vitals were all stable, and he denied chest pain or shortness of breath on review of systems. So triage focused on the abdominal pain. They considered the differentials around this. And here's an excellent chart that shows a list of different differentials depending on which quadrant the abdominal pain would be located. He is evaluated by a physician about six hours later. The doctor also isn't too sure about what's wrong with him, but he also thinks that the patient doesn't look too well. So he orders a broad workup. Unfortunately, about seven hours since the initial presentation, the EKG reveals an acute anterior MI, but there was a huge delay in the diagnosis and he did not receive optimal treatment. There was a pretty significant difference in presentation between these two patients. Patient one, you had a 67-year-old male with very typical signs and symptoms of an acute MI. Patient two is an atypical presentation in a frail elderly person. He was confused. He had a history of mild cognitive impairment. He denied chest pain or shortness of breath. It was actually the neighbor who was worried about him and help with describing the patient's previous baseline and his current signs and symptoms. This combination of factors subsequently led to a bigger delay in diagnosis. Why do we get these type of atypical presentations in older adults, and why is it a problem? There are four different reasons that can help to explain this. Number one, age-related physiological changes. Older people have a blunter response to illness. They do not have the same acute physiological response that young adults have. Number two, because there's a loss of this physiologic and functional reserve in frail older people, illness may present as so-called geriatric syndromes, which may present with falls or incontinence or confusion and or immobility. Number three, the older population are much more likely to have other comorbidities, which interact and affect the presentation of the big picture. Number four, older adults often under-report symptoms and often have to rely on caregivers for the history. What are geriatric syndromes? In a study of elderly patients with an atypical presentation of illness in the ER, 99% of the atypical presentations had some component of a geriatric syndrome, with falling being by far the most frequent symptom in 71% of them. New urinary incontinence was seen in 3%, functional decline in 11%, and cognitive decline in 29%. In 66% of these cases, the cause of the geriatric syndrome was clear. There's many examples of atypical presentations, which in fact can be more typical in older people. Examples include a pulmonary embolus. Sometimes these can present as syncope or fall rather than pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, or breathlessness. Sepsis may be more subtle, 
and present as altered mental status with confusion or falls. There may be no fever. There may be no elevated white count. There is some evidence that SERS criteria have poor sensitivity in identifying organ failure, and sometimes it can even present as an exacerbation of a chronic illness, such as heart failure or diabetes. Pneumonia in the older population may present as difficulties doing activities of daily living, delirium or falls, and classic signs and symptoms of cough fever, and pleuritic chest pain may be absent. However, some studies do show that increased respiratory rate is common. Some studies on the older population have shown that the mean age is around 78. 69% of these patients typically come from home. Around 19% come from the nursing home. What's important is 65% of these patients are dependent in ADLs in some way, shape, or form. What's interesting here is you may have no leukocytosis in 31% of these patients, no fever in 39% of these patients. What this shows is that patients with advanced age who have premorbid functional impairment and cognitive impairment on admission are more likely to have a typical presentation of pneumonia. It is common to see a comorbid condition become exacerbated when these cases occur. An acute abdomen in an older person is less likely to have classic signs such as severe pain, tenderness, or guarding. Their white count might not be that elevated, and they might not have a fever on presentation. And because their bowels can be frail secondary to poor blood supply, they're much more likely to perforate. It's not uncommon for these patients to present with confusion. Alarmingly, the mortality in patients greater than the age of 80 with abdominal pain nearly doubles if initial diagnosis is delayed. One of the most common atypical presentations is an acute UTI presenting as altered mental status. The typical symptoms of urinary tract infections such as pain with urination or burning or urgency and frequency might not be present. Some older adults will present with worsening incontinence or new incontinence. Also remember, 20 to 50% of women and 20% of older men may always have bacteria in the urine. Biliary tract disease is, interestingly, the single most common cause of abdominal operations in the elderly. It may present with vague or nonspecific abdominal complaints. In gallbladder perforation, only a third of patients had a history or prior symptoms of gallstones. And common bile duct stones are found in around 10% of the time in younger patients at the time they have their gallbladder removed, but they're found in more than 50% of patients over the age of 70. Acute diverticulitis in the elderly is more aggressive. There can be more inflammation more abscesses, there can be more fistula, and more obstruction of the colon. Elderly patients have a much higher risk of developing peptic ulcer disease and complications from NSAIDs. About one-third of patients have no pain. When it is present, can be non-localized, and it can be all over the belly. They can also present as falls or syncope or fatigue because they're having anemia. When you compare younger and older people, duodenal ulcers are less common in the older people. Typically, epigastric pain is less common, only in 35% of older people compared to 91% in younger people, and bleeding is much more common. In summary, the factors contributing to these type of atypical presentations included decreased pain and temperature perception due to aging, but it can also be due to chronic analgesics that can blunt pain perception. A decreased immune system response would lead to things like not having a fever and not having a white count. You could see that as a result of physiologic aging, and it can also be seen as a result of chronic steroid use. Adverse effects of medication should always be taken into account, and other factors include multiple comorbidities and the diagnosis of dementia, delirium, or cognitive decline. The most important thing you must know 
is the patient's functional status. Good functional status means more typical symptoms and poor functional status means more atypical presentations. There is no such thing as you're 70 years old and therefore you're old. Age itself has no relevance to disease presentation or functional status. We've all seen a 60 year old who might be sicker than a 90 year old. So age is just a number. Function is what determines what's going to happen and how much reserve a patient has. Comorbidities may affect presentation. Multiple comorbidities may be synergistic and contribute to a single presentation. For example, a patient with reduced mobility due to osteoarthritis and heart failure being treated with diuretics can present with incontinence. This means that sometimes these symptoms respond to multiple interventions or perhaps even just one. Reducing the diuretics and changing the treatment for heart failure may prevent the incontinence and tip the balance in the patient's favor. Sometimes one comorbidity can lead to a presentation in another system, the so-called causal effect. For example, a patient with sepsis due to pneumonia may develop atrial fibrillation, which leads to a presentation of heart failure. Just treating the atrial fibrillation may not improve the patient's breathlessness as there is an underlying pneumonia. A previously hidden comorbidity can be unmasked after the occurrence of an external stressful event. For example, an elderly man presenting with worsening heart failure following his wife's death. The heart failure may be due to not taking his medication and in turn be due to hidden cognitive impairment, which has only become apparent after his wife's death. In summary, the simultaneous presence of two or more diseases can lead to a synergistic or causal relationship to the patient's presentation, or the real diagnosis may be hidden. Elderly people often present with functional problems with social connotations, as well as purely medical problems. And this is why comprehensive geriatric assessments are crucial and should be multidisciplinary. In conclusion, the adults that are most likely to present with an atypical presentation are those who may have difficulty with ADLs, like eating, bathing, dressing, transferring, toileting, and walking independently. Up to 99% of these atypical presentations are likely to show up into the ER as a fall, new urinary incontinence, functional decline, and or cognitive decline. And being vigilant of this can help physicians ID an underlying cause to the atypical presentation. Underlying comorbidities can further complicate a definitive diagnosis, and the healthcare of an older adult extends beyond the traditional medical management of illness. It requires evaluation of multiple issues, including physical, cognitive, affective, social, financial, environmental, and spiritual components that influence an older adult's health. The comprehensive geriatric assessment is based on the premise that a systematic evaluation of frail older persons by a team of healthcare professionals may identify a variety of treatable health problems and lead to better health outcomes. The more frail an older adult becomes, the more decline in performance we see and the larger decrease in homeostatic reserve. At some point, recovery from external stressors becomes more difficult and the ability to return to a previous baseline is lost. Once we reach this state, the inevitable of our own mortality will take its course.